Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our special edition of History Happy Hour, uh, Track Talk and Racing Rivals. My name is Callie McCune. I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Indiana Historical Society, and it's my pleasure to see so many of you here. I hope you have your beverages ready um, and are ready for a great conversation um, and stories about the Indianapolis 500 and the track. Um, we're really excited to present this History Happy Hour as a special edition um, in conjunction with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as part of uh, 500 at Home. Uh, we're really excited to be able to bring you historians that know so much about things in our collection and things about what makes Indianapolis uh, its city and that racing culture such a heartbeat of our city. And um, talking on a day when we normally would probably be out of the track enjoying the sun and watching the cars go by and getting some autographs. Uh, if you haven't gotten a chance, make sure that you check out all the other 500 at home activities that are happening today, tomorrow, and then in the future as we get back to racing in August and July too, for that matter. Um, if you don't know about the Indiana Historical Society, we like to call ourselves Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. We do that by collecting millions upon millions of pieces of paper and then finding exciting, interesting, and creative ways to share it. Um, sometimes those are exhibitions, um, which you can see when we're able to reopen our doors and welcome you back to the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana History Center. And sometimes those are publications or virtual events like this. Um, we're really excited to be able to talk about something that is so ingrained in Hoosier culture, um, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we do today. Before I toss it over to Doug and get us started, um, I want to make sure I go cover a couple of Zoom logistics and how today will work. Um, you've all been muted so far for, as coming in, um, and you'll know that because there's a little red microphone crossed off in the bottom corner of your screen. We'll keep you muted for most of our event, but there is a chat box and please feel free to drop any questions you have as we're talking in that chat box. I'll be monitoring it and putting in a few links as we go and then I get to pop back in at the end and ask those questions to Don and Doug and hopefully get some answers for you. Um, you we will be sharing our screen to show some historic images though part of this um, and you can toggle what your screen looks like um, by using the menu bar at the top of your screen, there is a way you can split it so you can see more of our participants, but we suggest you keep it in speaker view. That way you're really only seeing who's speaking, whether that's me or Don or Doug. Um, but feel free to view this as what works best for you. And again, um, use that chat box um, and put your questions in as we go. For uh, this conversation, we'll, Doug and Don will talk for about the first 30 minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. So we wanna know what you think and what you wanna know about. Um, if you enjoy this event, we've got lots more coming up. Join us at 5.30 on Thursdays for our normal history happy hours. Uh, this upcoming week, we're gonna talk about uh, early recording studios in Indiana and Jeanette Records. Coming up, we've got talks on the LGBTQ community, on um, the Who's Your Home Front during World War II, on more music history and so much more to come. You can find out about that and more at indianahistory.org and keep um, up to date on all the virtual events that we're offering. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Doug to get us started. Hi Doug, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having us, Callie. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to everybody um, unfortunately, we are not uh, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway right now getting things ready for the 104th running of the Indianapolis 500, which would have been tomorrow. And I'm really happy to say, and I don't normally say this, I'm really happy to say as I look out my window right now, it is pouring rain. <laughs> so I'm hoping that the rain continues through Sunday. And uh, it, I, I hope it's sunny wherever everyone else is, but I want it to rain here so I don't feel as bad that we've pushed the race to August. Um, you know, this is a great opportunity. I love the Indiana Historical Society. You guys have done such a great thing for uh, telling the story of Indianapolis and Indiana, uh, and I've had an opportunity to visit several times. And I know Donald, I saw him smirk a little bit. Donald is a huge music guy as well, especially the history of music. So uh, I'm certain that those are some of the conversations that Donald might even join in to listen, because as much that as he was That wasn't a smirk. That was a <laughs> it was smile. a smile. Yeah, you know, <laughs> So uh, uh, Donald loves uh, music as much as he loves uh, the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But today we're here to talk about the history 
of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And I kind of quickly glanced through uh, some of the folks that were on the chat. Uh, so, so good to see somebody like Linda Mansfield on here. If you don't know Linda, Linda is an unbelievable uh, racing uh, PR gal here in Indiana, uh, has a lot of understanding of history. Uh, one of my favorite people on social media, Judy Greeson, is on here as well, also a huge uh, IndyCar fan. And I'll, I'll glance through here later to see who else I recognize in there. But so fun to uh, get a chance to talk to some of the people that normally we'd be seeing face to face here at the Speedway. But uh, one of the beautiful things about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is our history and tradition. It's what makes us special. Uh, and really, it's all of those traditions that our fans create. Uh, when they come here and the stories that they can retell. And nobody retells those stories or understands them better than Donald Davidson. I like to tell folks that if we were walking uh, through a crowded Pagoda Plaza behind the Pagoda, and on one side I had Mario Andretti, on the other side I had Donald Davidson, uh, people would go, wow, that's Mario Andretti, but hey, I want to talk to Donald Davidson. <laughs> so it's really uh, pretty cool that we get an opportunity to spend a little bit of time with Donald. And we've got a, a few pictures. And for those of you that really understand the Speedway, you're gonna know some of these stories, but for those of you who are just joining for the first time um, because you uh, follow the Indiana Historical Society, I think you'll enjoy some of these stories. And Donald might be able to give us a little bit of a twist that even those of us that understand these stories a little bit better um, might give us something new that we can remember as we go forward. But we're a 110 year old facility, 111 year old facility actually coming up here in a, in a month or so when we first started racing. And we're obviously known for the Indy 500 and our cars. But Donald, uh, we started somewhere other than cars when we were uh, first racing in 1909. Well, actually, yes, that we'll, we'll go with the top shot first. Uh, when the track was built and uh, the intent was that it would be a testing facility for the automobile industry, but not necessarily because aviation would have a part as well. And in the very early days, there was a lot of uh, crossover between aviation and, uh, and, and automobiles and motorcycles. And uh, just uh, I want to, you know, an early tangent here. I tell people, if you read anything about the history of the early days of the automobile or aviation or motorcycle or even power boats, it's all the same people. It just seemed like everybody knew everybody else and everybody seemed to work with everybody else. And so the idea was that this would be a proving ground. And it's, uh, uh, you know, 400 plus acres, well, way more than that now, of uh, farmland. I think 328 was the original purchase. And uh, as they were laying out the track, the largest that they would, could get that would fit on the property, which ended up being a two and a half mile rectangular shaped oval, which I tell people, I know that's a contradiction in terms, but that's what they call it. While the track was being laid out, they had the first event and that is the top shot. And it is a balloon race. Well, it was more than a balloon race and it's been described as a hot air balloon race. It's actually gas filled. But more importantly, it was actually the US National Balloon Championship. And I didn't realize this for the longest time. Actually, it's the first one and Carl Fisher and Jim Allison and the partners actually outbid several cities to get this event here. I think there's a total of eight balloons, and uh, I th I'm probably off on this, but I think they had like uh, five professionals and three that were amateurs or somewhere in that um, in that range. And so where we are, this is the first competitive event ever held at the track. And as I have suggested, uh, we can see a lot of people on the infield there, but there were thousands more that were outside because I say the Hoosiers were pretty smart and cautious people. And they figured that you could see the greater part of a balloon ascent from outside the grounds. Anyway, there was quite a, a mob there. Uh, Thomas Marshall was the uh, about eventually to be the vice president of the United States, was the governor at that time. And uh, he, in fact, was late getting here because the traffic was so bad. He was coming out the Georgetown Pike, which is 16th Street now. And uh, the, the traffic was so bad that he parked in a farmer's a lot and then trudged to the track uh, only to see the balloons taken off in the distance. But anyway, this is a little earlier in the day. And where we are, we are looking east. And so that is sort of looking over to about turn two. But the fact that it's a panorama, it's distorted a little bit. But uh, where the balloons are mired is approximately where the museum building is now. 
And if you look over to the right there with the grandstand, that backs up to the Crawfordsville Pike. On the other side of that, there's a dirt road that it would eventually become 16th Street, but it wasn't 16th yet. And that's where Tunnel 2 is now. And uh, so basically that was it, I think. And, and they had a, a fair crowd on the, uh, on the grounds, as I say, that were mostly society types, but the, the, uh, the greater part of the viewing audience was, uh, was outside. And then the shot that we have below, this was after the track was off and running and they'd had motorcycle races and automobile races. This was an air display. Now we still didn't know we were gonna have a 500 yet, but this is the third week of June of 1910. And there was a flying display here. Now it's been described as air races. They were not races, it was a display. And I think it lasted like five or six days. And I have to say, that if this photo, and I hope nobody takes exception to this, uh, that photo is doctored. And uh, the technology at the time it was done is not quite where it is now. But typically, the planes were only in the air one at a time. And I think there was only a couple of incidents during the whole four or five days, five days, where an aircraft took off before one had landed. So you might have two in the air. but uh, um, sorry, Historical Society, but with all of the aircraft in the air there, there's more aircraft in the air in that shot than they actually had. <laughs> but uh, anyway, just to wind this one down, and I'll give you shorter responses on some of the others. Uh, twice in one week, uh, oh, the Wright brothers bought several planes, by the way, and uh, they had an aviator named Walter Brookins, who was only 21 years old from Dayton, Ohio, and twice in one week, he set the world altitude record, which was uh, like, I think it ended up like at 4,936 feet. And uh, that doesn't sound like much, but that was the world record at the time. As I say, he broke it twice in one week, and then it probably lasted until they had the next air display in St. Louis or Los Angeles or wherever. Anyway, uh, it, the, the takeoff point, was from a unirail that they had on the infield. And when he had done the second run, when he came down, he wasn't able to make it back to the track. And he landed in property that is uh, northeast of the immediate track property. And it's where the solar farm is right now. <laughs> and uh, so I remember when, uh, Doug, you were down there and I was down there when that place was sort of kind of dedicated up there, uh, just, uh, uh, north east of the track, and I thought, golly, this is where Walter Brookins had to uh, uh, to uh, to land the plane in 1909 or 1910 rather, and then they put it on a a horse drawn vehicle and towed it back. But uh, anyway, that's probably more than you wanted to know about those two shots. <laughs> you know, that's a, it's actually a fantastic to tell us that, and I and I hadn't heard the Walter Brookins story about uh, the solar farm. For those of you that don't know. There is a little piece of property uh, northeast of uh, the golf course, if you will. So there's a there's a train track that runs on the immediate east side of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and then a little bit north of 16th Street, there's a section of property that the Speedway owns. It's about uh, 75 acres or so that is currently a, is a currently a solar farm. So uh, that's an interesting story, Donald. I hadn't heard before, um, and. Uh, um, that's one I'll have to remember now when I talk about the solar farm. Uh, I, right now, I tell people it's it's a great use of property. I'm going to uh, tell them now why it was a great use of property in 1910. <laughs> what we skipped between 1909 and 1910, uh, we actually ran motorcycles and cars in 1909. Uh, and then obviously, we know what happened in, in 1910. And then in 1911, what happened is really the roots of what we all love so much and what we would have been celebrating tomorrow, uh, the Indianapolis 500. Ray Haroon, um, is famous for winning that first race. He's famous for uh, the rear view mirror. If you get an opportunity ever to go to the museum, you can actually see this actual race car sitting in the museum alongside Dan Weldon's 100th anniversary winning car and Alexander Rossi's 100th running uh, car uh, right there in the museum, all of, all of our history. But one of the great things about Donald, and people always talk about who's the next replacement when Donald decides he wants to retire. The one thing about Donald Davidson is his knowledge comes from reading and understanding, but most of his knowledge, and especially the knowledge we love so much, the stories, the anecdotes come because he's had an opportunity to meet a lot of the folks that are, his, that are really important to our brand. 
or he's met family members. So he's heard these stories firsthand. They're not written down anywhere. They're all in his head. Uh, and you, Donald, actually had an opportunity to meet and be around Ray Haroon a little bit. You got to know what he was like, what he was about. Why don't you talk a little bit uh, about Ray Haroon, what it meant to him to win that first 500, and, and any other little anecdotes that we might not know about our first Indianapolis 500 winner. Boy, we're gonna, I'm going to use all the time up here, but yeah, I was blessed. To, I have uh, a, it's okay, Donald, because I'm guessing that everybody on here um, listens to you often, and, and we're here to listen to your story, so feel free. I'm, I'm all, I got all afternoon. It's raining outside. All right. Bless you, Doug. Thank you. Well, anyway, yes, I, I met Ray Haroon uh, when I was first at the track in 1964 as a very, very young lad. Don't go there. And uh, so uh, he was extremely nice to me. And then after I came back and um, was hired at the United States Auto Club by Henry Banks and uh, became the sort of the statistician, there was a position opened up because there was some guy named Jeff Bowles that was going to go to uh, uh, to law school and leave, and and uh, he was married but didn't have any kids yet, and who knew who that was going to turn out? <laughs> anyway, so no, that's, that's true. I owe your dad a great deal. If he hadn't have quit USAC, I don't know what I would have done. But so anyway, um, I learned to drive and got a car because I wasn't driving yet, and um, I had an open invitation to go see Ray Haroon, and in his later years, he lived in a trailer court on the south side of Anderson. And if you're going up the old way, if you go up Pendleton Pike and you're on the way to what used to be Sun Valley Speedway uh, for, the, for the racetrack there, just before you get there, there's like a split in the road. And I think the right hand sort of goes off to Muncie or somewhere. Anyway, there's a trailer court. And I don't know if that's still there or not, but that's where Ray Haroon lived. And I had an invitation, a standing invitation to go there and I did that two, three times. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity. I would knock on the door and the wife would say, oh yes, come in. And uh, he'd come down the hall in his pajamas and dressing gown and sit down and talk. Uh, I uh, would describe him as very professorish. He was a little tiny fellow, but spoke very slowly and he spoke just like he was a professor uh, at a university. And he told me all these wonderful stories and uh, the one was that he said, I didn't want to drive. When, they, when uh, uh, Walter and Howard Marmon said, look, they're gonna have this 500 mile race uh, next May. And he said, yeah, I don't want any part of that. I don't want to drive in it. I retired. And uh, he said, I never really thought of myself as the race driver ever. He said, I was an engineer. And I, I thought that the best way to see if what we thought might work was working was drive it myself. So I said, so when I'd be in a race, I was actually checking to see that everything was working out as we thought that it might. And so they, he, he said that, he said, I've run a 200 mile race. I don't want to do any more. I'm done. And he said, I told them, Joe Dawson is perfectly capable of driving this car. And they said, well, we've got Joe in the, in the stripped down passenger car. We want you in the single seater. And so he reluctantly came out of retirement. There's a lot of other side stories. But anyway, he said, during, he said, I got credit for inventing the rear view mirror. He said, I didn't invent the rear view mirror. He said, I'd seen it done. He said, in 1904, I was a chauffeur for William Thorne, of the president of Montgomery Ward in Chicago. And he said, I, got, I was his chauffeur but he said, when I got the job, I didn't know how to drive, but it was tiller steering, so it wasn't hard to figure out. So he said, so um, Mr. Thorne was taking a meeting, and I'm outside in the vehicle, waiting on the, you know, next to the, to the building. And he said, there was all this commotion going on on the street. And there was animals, and there was people on bicycles and vehicles, oh, boy. And traffic pattern. And then he said, along comes this fellow, on a horse-drawn taxi cab. He's sitting up on top, cloak, top hat, and a whip, and kind of going back and forth. And he said, he had a pole sticking out with a mirror on it. And every now and again, he would glance into the mirror to see that he wasn't knocking somebody off his bike or running into a pig or, or whatever was going on out there. And he thought, that's a good idea, or I'll have to remember that. So. Uh, fast forward to May 1911, 
And uh, the single seater here was not built for the 500. It run the 1910 season at a number of events, but they were shorter and nobody was concerned that he didn't have a riding mechanic. But when they're practicing for the 500, there's a lot of new teams from other parts of the country and they hadn't seen this thing. And so the official said, they're concerned that you're a safety hazard because you're not carrying a second person. The rules did not require that you carry a riding mechanic. It's just everybody did because they were stripped down passenger cars. But the Marmon engineers, Maroon included, said, if we build a single seater, uh, we can be more aerodynamic, cut through the air better, and we can save the weight of a second person. And so anyway, they, uh, he said, I remembered the fellow with the, with the mirror. So he said, we went downtown and we bought a mirror three by eight inches and mounted it above on, on rods above the cowling. So if you look in, in what, I, what people refer to as the wonky wheel shot, uh, and the, the explanation for that is why are they wonky wheels? Because the car was running faster than the shutter speed could handle. So that's the reason for that. But this is 1911. Look at the casing that contains the mirror. It produces downforce. And it wasn't an accident. And uh, Jim Rathman, and I am jumping around all over the place here, Jim Rathman, the 1960 winner of the 500, was very good friends with the astronauts. And Gus Grissom, Alan Shepard, and uh, uh, Gordon Cooper amongst the, the you know, you, you're, you're trying to name the seven, aren't you? You look, Doug, you look like you were trying to name the seven. Anyway, they were very interested in, and they were fascinated with the Marmon and the aerodynamic qualities of it and said, how did they know to do that in 1911? Anyway, so the uh, little closing uh, part here is, and I, and I tell this rather guardedly because uh, he told me sort of more or less in confidence and I've repeated it a few times and I'm afraid that it, it's, uh, it, it, it may have uh, uh, come back to bite me a couple of times. So I said, so you actually drove along and you could look underneath it and through it. And he said, yes. And I said, and then if you wanted to see what was going on behind you, you look up into this three by eight inch cinematic, uh, cinema view. And he leaned forward to me and he's like 89 years old in his pajamas and dressing gown. And he leans over to me and he says, to tell you the truth, it shook so bad on the bricks. I couldn't see a damn thing in it anyway. But he said, nobody knew that but me. So there's a little inside story that I guess is not so inside, but I've actually had somebody wrote a story about this one time and said that it didn't work. Well, that's not exactly what I said, but that's what Ray Haroon told me. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me just the opportunities that you've had to interact with the heroes of our sport and the legends of, the, of this event. And, and those are the great stories. I was going to ask you a story to tie back to earlier, but I'm going to move on. But uh, Ray Haroon was an engineer, but also built some airplanes. So there was a pretty cool uh, connection there to even our 1910 yes. event, just the, his love for aviation as well. Oh, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, it's funny. I just got a text message just right now um, that uh, Roger Pinsky had a question about, uh, about Borg Warner. And the next question here is about uh, uh, Borg Warner. You know, um, there's not a cooler trophy in sports than, uh, than the Borg Warner trophy. And it's pretty crazy when you see photos like the one right here, uh, when you see how small that it really was back in the day. And now that we're 103 winners in, uh, it's got the base on the bottom and it's a lot bigger. But uh, talk a little bit about how the Borg Warner trophy came about. And uh, I've seen pictures uh, where the top of that thing comes off, and I've actually seen um, some well, black don't and white. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty amazing the way that that tro the trophy travels and and the durability that it has yeah. uh, to have survived, um, you know, upwards of uh, ninety years almost now. Well, I had a couple of uh, Ray Haroon aviation uh, questions, but if Mr. Pensky wants to talk about the Borg Warner Trophy, I guess that's where we're going. Uh, yeah, the Borg Warner Trophy was actually unveiled in 1936 because at that time there was no permanent trophy. There were a number of awards, and uh, an award that, uh, that went all the way back was the L. Strauss Award, and that was a piece of artwork which changed every year. It was always something different. And so there was a business arrangement that was made 
in like 32, 33, or 34, something like that, where there were four companies that came together in a, um, um, in, in a deal, uh, which Mr. Penske would understand a lot more than, than I would. But anyway, these four companies came together. Borg Warner was one of them. And then also uh, what had been the Wheeler Shevler Carburetor Company. And so the question came up from somebody, uh, what can we do at the Speedway? Because apparently there's no permanent trophy. And uh, so this happened in, in uh, the summer of 1935. And right after the, uh, the race, uh, it was announced that uh, Borg Warner Corporation had um, commissioned a company and uh, the name of which escapes me at the moment. It's not Tiffany. Um, and I should know this and I shouldn't even have brought it up. But anyway, so they commissioned the trophy and it was unveiled at a dinner. I think it was the Waldorf Astoria in New York in February of 1936 is where they unveiled the Borg Warner Trophy. And uh, it, it had on it at the time um, a bas relief sculpture of every 500 winner up to that time, which was through 1935. And then on top, there was the character that represents speed. And uh, golly, we wish you'd put a loincloth on that thing because that's uh, caused some, uh, some people to, to uh, maybe a little offended over the years. But anyway, so um, I don't know that this is 1936. I think this is a little bit later because um, the fellow on the right, I, it looks like a movie star. It looks like Dennis Morgan, but it's way too early for Dennis Morgan. And I think that might be Ted Dosher, who was the uh, was the chief steward in 40 and 41, but I could be mistaken. But the fellow on the left has often been uh, identified as Wilbur Shaw, and it's not. That's a fellow named Freddie Mangold. I mean, uh, somebody suggested that Wilbur, a well-known author who's now deceased suggested that Wilbur Shaw was five foot two based on this shot and others like it. Wilbur Shaw was not five foot two, he was probably about five foot eight. But this gentleman was rather diminutive and was still around when I showed up, Freddie Mangold uh, was his name and he was a PR guy for the Borg Warner Corporation. And so after the 1936 race, uh, Louis Meyer had a bash relief sculpture put on and uh, he was already on there twice but it, now it was a new one and so every year thereafter the winner would get their uh, face put on in 1924 and 1941 there were co-winners because one driver started and the other finished uh, it's not uh, a relief driver it's not a riding mechanic or as Elio Castroneves explained to Juliana Huff who was his partner in Dancing with the Stars it's not a driver with two heads. Uh, it's actually, there's co-winners in two of those slots. And so finally, the question was, what do we do when it fills up? And uh, it filled up in 1986. So Bobby Rahal was the last uh, winner on the old one. And then they, they put a base on it and then the base filled up. And now there's a new base on it. And I think that's good until 2034. So. I don't know that you and I will have to worry about that one. But uh, anyway, it weighs about 80 pounds. And with the base, it's closer to 100. And uh, so with some amusement, uh, it's appeared in several films. It was in The Big Wheel uh, with Mickey Rooney. It was in To Please a Lady. It's also in Winning. And uh, Bobby Unser, uh, uh, who uh, comes in to congratulate Frank Capua, Paul Newman, who has won the most recent 500 in the film winning. Uh, Paul Newman is actually carries in what is supposed to be the Borg, Borg Warner Trophy, puts it down on the ground, and then an admiring young lady picks it up to look at it. And so we had a laugh about that because number one, the winner doesn't get to take it to the bars with them. And number two, Foyt couldn't pick that thing up by himself, let alone uh, let alone the, the lady. But uh, anyway, it's, it's one of the most iconic trophies. Sorry, this is more than you wanted, but I think if you were to say what are the you know four or five most iconic uh, trophies, of certainly in American sports, then I think it ranks up there with the uh, the Lombardi and and uh, the America's Cup 
and uh, it's actually been posed for Sports Illustrated, Doug, you'd know better about this, where they've done photo shoots where they had like three or four, like the Stanley Cup, the World Series trophy, they've got them all together, and the Borgs right in there with them. You know, and it wasn't an accident, I don't think, that they're in front of an Eastern Airlines airplane. Oh, yes, in fact, <laughs> good point. Yes, Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, who became the owner of title of the Indianapolis Speedway in 1927, in 1934, he went on to the board of Eastern Airlines, and then in 1938, he then became the president of, of Eastern Airlines. But again, uh, the first year for the trophy was 36, and I'm rather thinking, based on the who I think that is on the right, my guess is it's like 40 or 41, but yes, I, uh, that was lost on me. Yes, Eastern Airlines did have a connection with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yes, yes, it did. All right, we'll go to our next picture. That's the milk shot, I think. There you yep. go. It is the yes. milk shot. This is yeah. uh, uh, this is a victory lane. Um, can you uh, talk about when this really became a tradition, how it happened, and uh, what really caused it to become a tradition? Because it, yeah. it started as buttermilk, uh, went away for a bit, came back, and is now uh, maybe the most anticipated moment of victory yeah. uh, victory celebration is when you get to hoist the milk and now drivers, uh, some like it, some don't, um, but drivers often pour it on themselves. Well, like a lot of traditions, it wasn't created. It happened by accident, it kind of evolved. And uh, honestly, as a little bit of a sidelight, and I know that the, the people at the Historical Society, a lot of people listening that have done research, if you've done real research, you run into this a lot. Sometimes it's not a clear cut answer to where things came from. And I've always been fascinated by that that uh, some of them have been recorded and others just kind of evolved and happened by accident. Uh, milk is sort of uh, kind of uh, between the two of those points. Louis Meyer uh, is responsible for introducing the idea, but he did it in a, in, in a you know, there was no uh, motive there. He drank buttermilk. He told me, he said, I regularly drank buttermilk. My mother told me when I was a boy, this will, will refresh you on a hot day. And I am told that when people wince when they say buttermilk, apparently buttermilk at that time was very different to, the, to what we understand as buttermilk now, but you'll have to have a, a dairy farmer explain that to, uh, to us. Anyway, so Louis Meyer said that, he said it started in 1933. Well, here's another example of doing research uh, when you ask somebody for their opinion, uh, you, you can't always rely totally on what they say is correct. He said, I started it in 1933. Well, he may have, except that Bill Cummings in 34 and Kelly Patillo in 1935, they didn't drink no milk. <laughs> but 1936, Louis is back for his third win, and he is handed a bottle of buttermilk. Well, uh, it was recorded on film. Uh, there, there's a little bit of newsreel footage of that taking place, and then it was in the newspapers, and evidently an executive in the milk industry said, look, that's great. You know, kids think that milk's the sissy drink, and Indianapolis 500 winner is drinking it, so let's make sure that that happens every year. And so uh, milk was consumed by the winner uh, in, in 37, 8, 39, and 40. That was Wilbershaw, Floyd Robertson, 38. And then uh, Wilbur Shaw was 37, 39, and 40. And then what we see is Maury Rose here, uh, co-winner in 1941. Uh, this kind of goes back to the Borg Warner uh, thing that I mentioned with the co-winners. Uh, a driver named Floyd Davis started the race, and then uh, Maury Rose, who had been on the pole with a team car and was out, then took over the Floyd Davis car and went on to win. So Maury Rose is there drinking the milk, and then Floyd Davis is to follow down in the bottom left hand corner. And uh, so anyway, then milk, uh, we, we broke for, for the five years, come back in 46. And then milk was offered in 1946 to George Robson, who consumed it. Well, for the next few years, milk was around kind of. And uh, I've done, a, I did years ago, a little bit of uh, newspaper research. Milk would be offered, but. Um, in some years, but declined in favor of water. Wilbur Shaw, bless his heart, said, 
when I won the race, and now he's the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at the, po the point we're talking here. He said, when I came in, I was thirsty. All I wanted to do was drink gallons and gallons and gallons of water. And so from 47 uh, through, uh, well, on a, on a little way, was a silver cup called Water from Wilbur. Well, in 1956, for whatever reason, uh, the, Ameri the, the, the milk industry became involved again. Now, in the, in the pre-war years, there was no incentive. They gave you the bottle and you drank it. So in 1956, it was introduced as a prize. If the winner drank milk, he got $300 and his chief mechanic got $50. Well, now I think it's 10,000, but uh, anyway, so that's how the thing was reintroduced. And the milk has been offered um, every year since 1956 and consumed by all but two parties. And as you know, Doug, I don't like controversy, so I'm gonna leave it there. And if you want to take it over, there's some neat stories, but I really would rather not go there. Yeah, I'm so with you. I, I'll stay, we'll stay on the positive stories. We won't talk you. about orange yeah. juice or anything like that. I, I would like to say one thing here in defense of Maury Rose. Uh, Floyd Davis was not given a lot of credit for this win. And Lou Moore and he evidently had a falling out during practice. And so the thinking is that Maury Rose and Lou Moore, and there's a couple of other incidents that came later that would uh, come under the controversial uh, uh, banner. But there were those that said that Rose and uh, Moore were in cahoots and that Floyd Davis was sort of pushed out of it. Well, Floyd Davis had come to, uh, evidently he and Lou Moore got sideways somewhere. Maury Rose, actually it's reported in the newspaper that when he came down after winning the race in the Davis car, he actually pulled up at the pitch because he was going to get out and let Floyd Davis drive the car down to the victory area. That's reported in the paper. Davis had already gone down to the victory area, so Rose then drove it down. But in the day after shots, unfortunately, Davis is not a part of it. And that was because of an unfortunate uh, falling out that he had with Lou Moore. So I just, I just wanted to, uh, uh, not that anybody really cares about that, but Maury Rose got credit for, for that one. And um, he was trying to include Davis as part of the ceremonies. So I have a really quick question. I'm um, just looking at that photo right there. So I, I'm assuming that's down on the south end of what is yes. today pit lane. Correct. But what was, um, so there's a gap between what looks like the victory celebration location and where the spectators were. Yes. Can you describe why that was there? And ex yes. Okay, that'd be great. I've not seen this photo before. It's very cool. All right, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, Doug, you know me, there's not an easy answer to this one. Uh, when the race was over and they didn't end it with the winner, as you know, for many, many years, uh, they would let as many cars complete, at least 10 to 12 if possible, go the 500 miles. So when the winner crossed the line, you know, and then the, the victory lane and people were going home, cars were still running on the track, you know, finishing seventh, eighth and ninth and so on. But it became uh, by around, I don't know, 13 or 14 or so, it became the procedure that you would drive down past the pits and then make the left turn to then drive it back to the garage area from inside of turn one. And then it got to be where the winner would stop there. So the thing kind of developed. And uh, then they realized that as they were having people crowding into the shot down there, that they erected in 1938 what they called the bullpen. And that's what we're looking right now. We're looking north and uh, you can see the fence with people on the other side of the fence. So the National Guard were uh, policing the event. And so the winner would come down the main straightaway. You can see the pagoda way off in the distance there. So the, tra the, the straightaway is over to the left. You'd come down past the pits, hard left, into what they called the bullpen area. And then the National Guard would shut the gate. <laughs> and so you were in the, uh, in the you, you, and that's to the left of where we are. And... Uh, so that was there all the way until, um, I don't remember how late the fence was, but that was still the victory area uh, through 1970. 
And then, and then in 1971, they moved the enclosure to the horseshoe area in front of the master control tower. And little trivia for you to work on. You, I know you know this answer. Uh, who was the last person to drive down to the old Berkshire Lane where Maury Rose in this shot is? And then who was the first person to pull up into the horseshoe area at the foot of the master control tower? And the answer is Al Unser and Al Unser, because he won it in 70 and 71, different locations. Sorry, I love this stuff. No, I, and, and, and all of us love this stuff. And I just, I'll just make a comment that really has nothing to do with the Speedway. So I just said I'd never seen this photo before. And it really goes to where, how we started here with the Indiana Historical Society. Uh, we have this amazing asset in, in Indianapolis that, that really is a caretaker of a whole bunch of information related to our state, our state's history and collections that even somebody that's working at the Speedway 365 days a year, and I love this, I've never seen this image before, I just want to let you all know if you're doing studies, you're doing, you're looking on history, the Historical Society is a great place to be. And it really depends on each of us to either join it as a member or contribute. So I wasn't asked to do this. It just hit me that we're sitting here and we've got this great caretaker. So you can go to indianahistory.org and certainly find a way to contribute. And if you're studying and you're trying to find more information, th there's some amazing stuff that I, I didn't even know existed. And I'm sure in uh, that happens across the board as people are trying to figure out history, but it's an amazing asset that we have there. And thank you for hosting this, first of all, but that's a, a great oh, way to- uh, I to really promise I didn't pay him to say that, but oh, that was amazing. Hey, Doug, if, if I could just dro drop in for a moment, I love the big photographs. Uh, I just love to study shots like that are there. Some of my favorite photos about the Indianapolis Post Speedway don't have any cars in them. Right. And uh, just, uh, I, I had a theory if, if we, if, well, we're away from that shot now, because they evidently, oh, they, they, the stage say, manager wants me to move along here. But if I we, was gonna that, uh, in, in that, well, I, I just had a, a theory. Go back one more. Yeah, go back one more. If you could go back one more for just a moment. All right. Um, there were several gates like that around the facility. And obviously there was one that led from the pitch to go out onto the track. And today, at all the thousands of racetracks, you know, hundreds and hundreds around the country who use the term pit gate. My theory is that may have come from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where the entrance to the pits literally was a gate, just like we're seeing there. Well, I'm thinking that we should just go ahead and say it started there and let somebody try and prove us wrong, because that seems like a pretty reasonable, um, a reasonable explanation for how that happened. Um, Callie, I know you added a few photos on the, onto the end. These were the ones that really uh, Donald I had talked about. Um, and now there's a few more here, and then we'll take some questions. But uh, um, Donald, why don't you talk about this? I mean, we were a proving ground for the automobile, but uh, Carl Fisher was uh, uh, pretty much in love with bikes, and then he was really in love with the automobile yeah. and, and, and that history, and that, that's still in our DNA today. Talk a little bit about this photo. Well, actually, this, this is a photo op when um... – uh, Carl Fisher, who's the gentleman in the vehicle on the left, and uh, this the, he's your role model. Doug Bowles, I think, got a lot of his ideas and the way that he goes about his uh, daily life now, I think he's influenced by Carl Fisher, because uh, Carl Fisher realized how important the media was. And of course, we're just talking print media. But, uh, and I think there's an explanation to who everybody is in this shot, but those are all local, uh, mostly uh, newspapers and publicist types, I believe. And uh, this is at the time the track was being built. We can see the fence in the background, but I, I think this was just like a, uh, like a media day where Fisher said, boys, you know, they, they, I probably uh, no doubt that alcoholic beverages were involved at some point and uh, smoking cigars and so on and so forth. But anyway, no, he just said, boys, come on out and we'll show you what we're doing out here. Yeah, that's a that's pretty amazing. Uh, just looking at that photo, uh, and especially looking at the surface upon which they are uh, parked, there is a uh, uh, pretty impressive. I, and the, those cars are beautiful. Well, that's not racetrack surface. That's infield. That's yep. just the brush on the infield. And uh, but um, anyway, just said you know let's line them up and take a photograph. And uh, but th there is a th there's a key somewhere to explain who all of those people are in that shot. It's great. Um, I'm going to go to the next one. Yep. I, we will make sure to put, I'll put in the chat the link to that photo, promise. Okay. Uh, this is the, uh, on the morning of the 1911-500, and uh, the, the, um, uh, the, you can see the cars that are lined up. Actually, 
there, there are actually five abreast, and but the front row has four. Nothing's easy. Uh, in what we now know as the pole position is a passenger car. And the fact that they had 40 cars had met the qualification requirements, and the thinking was, we've been doing standing starts all along with, with 15, you know, 11, 17 cars in some of the races. We've got 40. That's too many for a standing start. So Fisher said, well, when I was racing bicycles, we had a vehicle, uh, we had a pace vehicle of some kind. And so the thinking was, let's put a passenger car at the front. And when, we, when, when the bomb goes off to, to start or to, to push them off, the pace car will lead the field around. And at, at the end of the first, uh, they'll come around once. It won't be scored. We'll run about 50 miles an hour and then simply pull over to the side and let the 40 cars are rolling and uh, have a flying start. And so that's what they did. Did they come down for the green flag? No, they came down for the red flag. They didn't use the green flag for starting until 1930, but nothing's easy here. Uh, but look at the crowd that's gathering already. This is probably, you know, what, 10, 15 minutes before the start. And uh, it's very much of a society crowd. They figured they had 80,000 people attended the first 500. Union Station, a lot of people came from by train. If they would come from Union Station and, and the, uh, the, the local uh, stop was over where the Speedway gas station is now. And in fact, you can still go out and trace where the tracks were. And um, so uh, Union Station, I think, had 75,000 people go through that day. And um, then uh, it, this shot's blocked from me, but I know that over to the, uh, to the right, you can see two what I... This was before they had the, the pagoda, which went up in 1913. There's two buildings which I describe as box kites standing on end. And uh, that's the judges stand and where they had some of the uh, media. I, I've got a question, just looking at this, again, another photo that yeah. I've not ever seen before. So, and, and I've never thought about this looking down the front stretch. So if you look there to the left or to the west of the yeah. racetrack between what would be a temporary fence, I assume, to keep the spectators whoever's allowed in that little walkway there yeah. it looks as if um there is a there is no transition between the height of the racetrack and wh what looks like a trench there to the what would it be driver's right so was was that just a drop off on the right hand side of the road i never thought about it when you said you haven't seen this shot before you have but you've seen it cropped okay uh, if you go down and imagine just the front row with the guy standing on the yes. wall <laughs> you, yes, you've seen it uh doug i never noticed that before um, and I can't decide if that's an illusion or if there's really a drop off between the racetrack. It would, it would certainly keep you in bounds. I can imagine that it would be because they did have a wall that when, when they put the bricks in, when, when it was uh, crushed rock and tar, there was no wall. When they put the bricks in, they put an outer wall in the turns. So when you go down into the turns, then there's a, mm -hmm. an outer wall. I rather think that that's just uh, probably earth. I'm guessing that's earth next to the bricks. I can't imagine they would have had a drop off of any kind. Yep. Perfect. I want to make sure that I pop in. I'm going to stop sharing this so I can ask a couple questions from the chat before uh, we kind of control <clears throat> time. We have a lot in there. Um, but I want to ask uh, one of the ones that we had asked, um, which I think was from Owen, who is I know an Ernie Pyle expert, but Owen talked about how Ernie Pyle wrote um, that he'd rather be in the Indianapolis 500 race than anywhere else in the world. Donald, do you have other writers that you particularly love how they've written about the race or talked about it? Well, I can tell you that Ernie Pyle thing, that, that's, uh, that, that's uh, got a, a few twists and turns to it. I'm looking at this multi a uh, faceted screen. I know some of these people, <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's a lot of people here. I know some of you. Hi. All right. Where that Ernie Pyle thing came, uh, that he made the state, he went to the 1912 500 and he wrote about this that he was there the day that Ralph De Palma led 196 of the 200 laps. And that, uh, that, that, that the only two he did, or the four that he didn't leave was one and two and 199 and 200. And he and his Australian riding mechanic, Rupert Jenkins, tried to push the car home. 
and uh, went into the history books as the great uh, sportsman through having been able to smile in, in defeat. And I think Pyle said something like uh, that I would rather have been that man, De Palma, than anyone else in the world, I think. And that he and some friends supposedly used to ride bikes or do little mock races in the, uh, on the farm. And one was Bob Berman and somebody was somebody else. And he said, I always wanted to be De Palma. That's where that came from. Uh, the rest of the question, I don't really know how to answer that. I'm, uh, Doug, <laughs> help. <laughs> I, you know, I was going to say, I mean, the, the writer that, um, and I think most of us, and, and Donald, you'll hate this answer, but um, I think most of us on on this uh, video call right now, the writer that we enjoy so much is is you. And it's because of the personal stories you tell. And, and, and there have been a lot of great pieces written about the Speedway over the years. Uh, but the beauty of your stories are they those firsthand experiences and the things that you're sharing today that we don't get the, you know, if you see a quote or two from some other writer, we know that you've had these experiences. So my, my favorite Speedway writer is Donald Davis. And that's why um, we love your books. But it's also why if anybody writes a book, they want the forward to be by Donald Davidson, because that is the stamp of authenticity. And it means that that book uh, has really been vetted and is telling true stories about the Speedway. So not to embarrass you, because I I know how much you uh, would rather not be in the limelight in that sense. It's certainly um, why I think all of us are here is because we love uh, your writing. Well, that's very, very kind of you. I'm trying to think of uh, some of the other people that came here that wanted to be drivers when they were, were boys. And it's always um, um, been very, very flattering when I've met a celebrity and they said, Oh, I know who you are. I used to listen to you on the radio when I was a little boy. <laughs> and that's happened a number of times. But uh, I, I can't think of anybody else. Um, that, but, but certainly Ernie Pyle did write that. I've seen that in, uh, in print somewhere. I would rather have been that man to Palmer than anyone else in the world, I think. And then there was always Pat Bedard. Oh, well, Pat <laughs> Bedard actually went ahead and... and uh, yeah, went ahead and uh, hey, this has got, you, you might enjoy this, it's got nothing to do with the Indianapolis Five. <laughs> I was up at Watkins Glen one year and there was a, there was a, uh, there were production, little tiny production cars. They weren't minis, but it was, it was like Hano or something like that. And uh, so uh, Watkins Glen would have the Grand Prix, but they'd have like seven or eight other events. And uh, that's where I first knew about Bob Lazier and, and Bobby Ray Hall and people like that. So anyway, they had this, uh, this event going on and Pat Bedard was, uh, was uh, working for Car and Driver and he was driving one of these cars, little tiny cars coming down their smashed straight away during practice and the way that they would acknowledge the pit signal, because there's no two-way radio, so they're reading pit boards. How would they acknowledge the pit signal? They'd beat the horn. And you'd hear all these beep, 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 beep. And I, that's, uh, when you say Pat Bedard, that's the first thing I think of. Well, when we were talking about riding and racing, I, you know, Pat Bedard, sort of back in my day, growing up, loving the Speedway, car and driver rider, actually ran the Indianapolis yeah. 500, had a, yeah. a pretty horrific accident, uh, walked away from it. But um, that's, uh, it is interesting how um, somebody like Ernie Pyle wanted to write, would rather be there. And certainly Pat Bedard yeah. wrote and was there. So that's You know, Pat cool. Bedard uh, ran in 83 and 84, and I hadn't seen him for years. When we did the photo, and forgive me, one of the highlights of my life, and uh, which took a lot of work, was the photo that we had the day before the 1911 race, where we had 161 Indianapolis 500 drivers. I see some nodding heads on the screen here. Uh, Pat Bedard actually was in that shot. That's, that's, uh, I hadn't seen him for years, nor have I seen him since. But he was one of those people like Bill Simpson, yep. Chip Ganassi, with everything else that they achieved in their life. Probably their defining moment was and that's certainly true of Simpson and, and, and Ganassi. If you talk to them, as you probably have privately, uh, uh, the late Bill Simpson, what, probably the highlight of their life was the fact that they drove in the Indianapolis 500 and they would come the day before the race, which would be the equivalent of today, except we're not doing it, and sign autographs along yep. with the other drivers because that, that's just, that was, you know, their defining moment, as they say. Yeah, we, actually, talk a lot. We, actually, we actually had some drivers reach out, old guys, and and say hey we're old but we want to we we want to sign autographs on this day can we do a virtual autograph session unfortunately it was just too late to do that oh, you know, even because they, they do love coming back and reconnecting with the fans okay Callie sorry go ahead next question no that's okay um we'll probably do like two more um we'll give a little extra time maybe if everyone's willing to stick around with us for a minute um 
one question that I kind of thought was interesting was Donald, is there a question about the speed, about the 500 that you've always wanted to be asked, but never been asked? No, I don't think so. I think I've been, I've been asked a lot of questions I didn't want to be asked. <laughs> so I'm looking, I can see Judy Gleason out there and Linda Mansfield, you're at the track. How come you're sitting in front of the, you're, the, the pagoda there and there's people in the stands? Am I missing something? No, bless you. <laughs> bless you uh, no, I can't think of anything that I wanted to be asked that wasn't. I just, I love, I do love telling anecdotes. Sorry if that, some of them are a little long, but, uh, but I, I love to sit with drivers, I love to moderate programs, and I like to just tell stories. No controversy, no gearhead stuff, just a human interest stuff. I think the consensus in the chat is, is that everyone loves sitting and hearing you tell stories too, so you're in good company here. Um, I just saw a thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll ask one other question, um, can you, uh, talk about what the criteria is for being a co-driver versus a relief driver, and so how that might have changed, you know, getting your head on the uh, trophy. Oh, golly. Uh, how long have I got? Uh, <laughs> 35 seconds? 40 oh, seconds? Right. I, I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> relief drivers. Not going to happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> relief, no, not going to happen. Relief <laughs> drivers used to be very common, but to be a relief driver where was a car would come in, Driver would get out, sure, all right, hi. Uh, a driver would get out and another would get in. They don't do that now. Uh, in recent years, they've had driver switches where it was prearranged that, like, for instance, in 2004, uh, Robbie Gordon, there was a rain delay. Robbie Gordon had to leave to go to Charlotte. And so Jacques Lazier came in as a, it was a driver switch during the red flag period. In fact, Jacques Lazier started up as a spotter in turn three and then came down and Linda Mansfield knows that story because I see her, her nodding. Uh, the last time that a drive, that a, a change of driver was made during the race, and I will wind up with this, 1977, when uh, John Mailer, late in the event, got out of the car exhausted and Larry Boom Boom Cannon from Danville, Illinois, or Oakwood rather, climbed in. Uh, there was a bit of a disagreement about who was going to pay his thousand dollars that he has for, but anyway, he went out and I think he ran eight laps and then uh, the race was flagged in. But he was very proud of that because although he didn't start the race, he said, I can tell my grandkids when A.J. Foyt won his fourth 500, I was one of the drivers still on the track. And there's another really useless piece of trivia that came up earlier in the day. Norman Bubby Jones was in that race and uh, he was out by the time that, uh, that Larry Boom Boom Cannon got in as a relief driver. But uh, now that it's hard to get two drivers from the same state and not that many from the United States, in 1977, there were two fellows in the race who both cut hair at one time at the same barber shop. <laughs> And I wish they were in business now because I need a haircut, somebody. <laughs> we all need it. <laughs> Me too, for sure. <laughs> Cal Nide was a barber who cut ponchos. Anyway, I go on and on. Can we do another hour here? <laughs> <laughs> we might be done for today, but we'll definitely look and see if we can set up more in the future. I want to thank you both so much for joining us uh, for History Happy Hour. It's been a real joy to work with the Speedway to put this all together. Um, and we love being able to share some of our collections and some of this history. Uh, with y'all. Um, and thank you everyone who's joined us today. Um, if you enjoyed this and you want to know more about Indiana history, again, we're here every Thursday at 5.30. Different Zoom channels, same kind of idea, new history. You can find all that at more at indianahistory.org. Um, if you missed a chance to donate, um, I know Bethany has dropped it into the chat, um, but we'd love for you to help support the Indiana Historical Society to put on great events like this. Um, you'll also get a link to that in your thank you email, which will come sometime between 10 and noon um, tomorrow. Um, that email will have a bunch of links, including links to our collections and the um, Indianapolis Motor Speedway's archive, where you can find out so much more about all the races and the Speedway history. Dig in while you're sitting on your couch. There's a lot to learn about. You'll also find a link to a survey in there. We'd love to know what you thought, how we can make things like this better. It'll take you one minute. It'll be really short, I promise. Um, again, st thank you for coming. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane. And we can't wait to see you in August out at the track. Bye, everybody. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks, Callie. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, happy.